Today we will talk about stateful property-based testing and see it in action, how I applied it to test a prototype of our game's logic. Uh, so I'll start from bottom up. So we first we'll talk about testing. Um, whenever we say testing, it really implies having some fixed input and we expect some fixed output. So this is really called example-based testing and the most famous technique in this space is test-driven development. So I'll touch a little bit on that as well. And then we will introduce property-based testing and finally our main topic today, which is stateful property-based testing. And I'll show you how I use it to fix a concurrency bug in a prototype. Um, the prototype is in Elixir and I'm going to use PropCheck, the library, uh, which is an Elixir wrapper of the underlying Erlang <coughs> property-based testing engine proper. So a little bit of self-introduction. My name is Lo Xun. Uh, that's my Chinese spelling. Uh, I've been interested in Erlang since university and uh, for the last few years I've been doing Elixir stuff uh, on side projects and sometimes prototype format at work. Uh, at work I'm a software engineer at CCP Games. Uh, with my team we've been working on, we've worked on uh, ESI or as we say it's easy, it's a player facing APIs for all of our games data. I also work a lot on our internal tools and pipelines such as build or monitoring solutions so on and so forth. Uh, recently I take over our new chat system which is in eJBD. And I basically wrap it in an Elixir uh, project. So finally, I, have, I can work with Erlang and Elixir at work. Uh -huh. So uh, as a company, uh, CCP Games makes EVE Online. It's a sci-fi massively multiplayer online game. Uh, it's also a sandbox, mostly driven by our players. So things like the economy in the game and most, uh, the production of most items in the game are all done by our players. Uh, but what interests me the most are fleet fights in EVE. So fleet fights in EVE is very unique. Uh, first of all, it's very large scale. Uh, we have, I think our current record is more than 6,000 players on the same battlefield, and that is 6,000 players fighting for one goal. Uh, and it's also very consequential. For example, the record battle of BTEC R costs more than $300,000 uh, Okay. So the record battle in BTEC R costs more than $300,000. Um, that is the rough translation of our in-game concurrency to real-world money. And that happens in 2014, so in the last four years, this record has been broken many times. Uh, but the problem of handling uh, of this fleet fight is uh, most of the logic of EVE Online is written in Python. Uh, so all of the 6,000 players are handled in a single Python process. Uh, to combat this, we introduced the concept called time dilation or tie dye, uh, which basically slows down the speed you can interact with, with the game system. For example, if you have a gun that you can shoot once every minute, then with 10 times tie dye, which is the slowest tie dye, you can only shoot it once every 10 minutes. So basically this gives us, uh, gives the single Python process more time to handle all the requests from the 6,000 players. But still, like, as a player in these big fleet fights, the experience is very bad because you know, the speed is very slow, the rendering, rendering is very laggy. Uh, so because I'm interested in Elixir and since I joined CCP and especially after I moved to Iceland and work closer with the core teams, uh, I've been always thinking about how can I do the space combat in EVE more parallel. Uh, I've done like small prototypes here and there but I'm slowly building up a grand plan to replace the entire space combat in EVE Online. But Every grand plan starts small. So uh, in the beginning of this year, with the help of our technical director, I started a prototype, prototype to replace the innermost part uh, or the core rules of EVE's space combat. So what is the core rules of space combat in EVE? Uh, we can abstract them to a few things. Uh, so first, we have shapes and models on the shape. We can abstract them to locations and item. The location is a shape and the item is everything on it. And Items carry attributes, for example, the speed of the shape, right? Uh, and the game comes to life when players interact with each other by modifying the attributes of each other's items. For example, the status wildfire uh, decreases your maximum speed or decreases your enemy's maximum speed. And, but you can use afterburn to increase your maximum speed. Um, so we abstract these to relationship. And combining all the four uh, attractions, we have this fancy name called Liar. Uh, it's also very funny because it's trying to be the source of truth of EVE space combat. Uh, but anyway, uh, these four abstractions build the logical foundation of everything in space. So uh, using uh, with Liar, I tried to achieve a few things. Uh, first of all, it's a prototype to replace the current implementation, which is uh, mostly in Python. 
Uh, the main difference is I'm trying to put each location into a separate Erlang process rather than a single Python process handling all 6,000 shapes. Uh, <coughs> and I prefer to call Erlang process actor because it's just simpler. Uh, and this will give us straight up multi-core parallelism, uh, or we can maybe even extend it to support multi-node. This should let us um, don't use faster cores, but more cores, so maybe it can reduce cost a little bit. Uh, actors communicate by message passing, so this system has an inherently eventual consistency built in. Uh, by that, I just mean from the outside, the system is not fully consistent until all the messages have been handled. Right. And another thing I want to try with this project is to uh, use Elixir metaprogramming uh, and to build a domain-specific language so that game design can design more interesting interactions that players can have between each other. So uh, because this project is trying to replace uh, existing implementation, we have a set of defined API to work with. Um, <clears throat> we start with the relationships. Uh, we basically have a few a, a set a set of like add modifiers or remove modifiers. And these modifiers all have like a source uh, item attribute or a source location to a target. Uh, but we, we, uh, another thing is we have to propagate the updates. What, but then I mean, uh, if A modifies B and B modifies C, whenever A is updated, we not only have to update B, but also consequently update C. And this is uh, <coughs> tracked or achieved by uh, maintaining a directed uh, cyclic graph in layer. Uh, and then to have those source and target for these modifiers, we have to uh, create item and attributes. So these are very basic, just wrapper around structs. So I have to create them or use getter and setters on them. And finally, we have locations. And because they are uh, actors or they are the runtime units, so we have to have APIs to start and stop them. Uh, our technical director is a big uh, TD fan, TDD fan. So uh, he convinced me to try test-driven development during the development of Lyre. Uh, and actually, it makes a lot of sense because we have uh, this set of defined APIs, so it's very easy to adopt test-driven development. Uh, it lets me focus on a single feature at a time, uh, so it's an incremental and iterative development experience. Uh, for example, uh, this is kind of similar to what Mihaus talked earlier. Uh, I have local modifier and remote modifier. By local, I just mean the two uh, the source and target are both on the same location. So you, you, know, you, you can handle it in one uh, call. But a remote one basically means the source and target are on different locations. So you have to do message passing between the locations to do it. So I can first handle the local uh, uh, situation and then write another test to test the remote situation and finish that. Uh, and all the tests I've written in test driven development are example based. Actually, most of the tests we write will be example based, uh, be it like an inter uh, integration test or behavior test. We always have like some defined input and expect some defined output. So uh, here is an example of my example based testing. Um, I think I need to explain the API a little bit. So first we start a location and we create two items and we load both of the items onto the same location. And finally, we call add item modifier uh, from basically the first attribute to, to the second attribute. And then we assert uh, the result. So uh, this modifier is an add modifier. So we're basically saying add the source value to the target. Uh, and in this case, it basically ends tw 10 to 20. So we are asserting 30 in the final line. Uh, but I think many of you who have done example-based testing, and especially with test-driven development, have seen many flaws or have many inconvenience with this, kind, this style of testing. For example, we, all ha we often have to write very heavy and duplicated setup. Uh, and this is the simplest case of the first API in the, in the, you know, the useful APIs. And even in this case, we have seven lines of code, and five all of them are like these five are just set up code, and so it's very heavy, and we have to uh, repeat those things for every other test as well. And another thing is we often use simple and static input, so in this case it's 10, 20, and we immediately know the answer is 30, because we don't want to spend extra mental energy when looking at your example-based testing to calculate some you know, float point mathematics or whatnot. And another one is you need your human brain to think of edge cases. For example, in uh, numerical cases, you have to think, does it work with zero? Does it work with minus values? Does it work with infinity? Or does it work with 
not a number. Uh, it's usually not a concern in airline systems, but you know, in some language, you have to think about those. So, uh, to how can we avoid all these flaws of example-based testing? Well, it's very easy. So we don't test examples, right? So <coughs> instead of testing examples, we test properties. Um, I will make a very short introduction to basic probability-based testing because we'll focus on stateful probability-based testing. Uh, so here we have a very dumb example. Uh, so it's basically trying to test when we create a new attribute because no modifier is, is applying to it. So the real value should be the same as the base value. Uh, it's a very dumb example. It's not useful at all. But we can derive some interesting things of uh, probability-based testing from this. First, we use generators instead of static input. So here we are saying the ID should be any integer and the value should be any float. Uh, this is interesting because it forces you to, de to define the input boundary of like what can be an ID and what can be a value, right? Uh, <clears throat> and then when you run the probability-based testing, the tool will randomize input from a very large search space from all possible integer and all possible floats. And if for something it fails, it will find these counterexamples and also try to minimize it for you. Uh, but this example is very dumb, right? Uh, it's not useful, nobody cares whether they are the same because obviously they should be the same. Uh, so how can we find some useful properties? Uh, there are many interesting or excellent materials and there's even one talk uh, in the Just Finish Elixir Conf uh, about picking properties. I recommend you guys watch it. But I'll just go over a few things. So first we can do, what we can do is what we call modeling. So basically we use a simpler or inefficient implementation to test the real or often more complex implementation. For example, we can use bubble test to test like quicksort uh, are doing the same thing. And another one, we can test partial invariants. So for example, after sorting a list, the size of the list or the elements, elements in the list shouldn't change. Uh, this doesn't really say anything about the functionalities of sorting functions, but still this is a property of any sorting functions. And finally, there's a interesting category which calls symmetric properties, and they're basically useful for uh, when you have like encoder and decoder. So basically what you do is you have, you pick anything A and you pass it through the encoder and decoder again, and you should expect the same A to come back. Uh, so before we go into stateful property based testing, uh, I actually want to talk about one more flaw what I discovered about the example-based test that I write, that I write during test-driven development. Uh, and this is when I done some initial stateful probability assessing and looking back at those tests. So what I found is I rarely do cross-feature test cases. Uh, for example, if you remember the, the, the example that I put earlier, uh, we just load two items and we directly call add, add modifier bef uh, after that. So we didn't think about, hey, what if we unload the item and then load it again, right? Does it still work? Uh, it doesn't uh, in the beginning. Uh, and also, like, nobody would ever think of this, right? You wouldn't think of, hey, what if I do some more variations before I actually start testing my functions? And this is, just, <clears throat> I think this applies to most other forms of testing as well. So be it integration test or behavior test, you always have a single piece of the functionalities that you focus on and you want to test that. Uh, so what I was asking at that time is like, how is my system going to be used in real world? Like, what if we add, add these modifiers and then add, add some other modifiers? Like, how can we, how can we, uh, how can we see like whether the system still works, right? So uh, can we have some generators, but instead of generating integers or input for a single function, can we have a generator for user behaviors? And this is exactly what stateful probability testing tries to help us, right? So it tries to simulate how your system is going to be used in real world. And we achieve this by modeling the system with an abstract state machine. And we use this state machine, abstract state machine, to generate a sequence of valid commands. And then we execute all the commands and see uh, whether the result it gives us is the correct, uh, it, whether the result we derived from the abstract state machine is the same that the real system gives us. Um, and we can also check invariance like during every step or after every command, commands basically. Uh, or like sometimes you can't even just execute all the commands. So 
like something crashes and whatnot. Uh, <coughs> uh, from like when we're writing the test itself, the code looks almost like stateless, except like we are not using a generator, we are using commands. And we are not doing any, uh, we, are calling, we are not calling any actual code in our system. We just call run commands. So these are the actually two uh, important APIs that the stateful property based testing tools gives us. So these, these two functions, they use some defined callbacks as in most of the cases how we provide like uh, extendable behaviors in or an OTP uh, does. And uh, it basically represents two steps in the stateful property based testing. So the two step is first we generate commands and we use four callbacks in here. So init commands, uh, command precondition and next state. And then when we're actually executing the property based testing or stateful property based testing, uh, we also have another callback called post, post condition. And we use the post, condi post condition to check whether the, re the result is correct or like we can also check invariants. So uh, to give you some idea like how all these callbacks work together, we can think of a, a very simple example of how a library works. Uh, so when the library system starts, we can say the library doesn't have any book and the user doesn't have any book. So it's represented by two empty lists. And the command is uh, what APIs does the system give you, right? We can say uh, we can add a new book, we can add a new book to the, to the library or the user can borrow a book from the library, or he can return one of the book from himself. Uh, <clears throat> so precondition basically says, hey, when is this command uh, valid? When is this command is valid? Uh, so at any point, we can add a new book to the library, right? But the user can only return, or can only borrow a book if the library have a book for you to borrow. And the same, he can only return a book when he has a book to return. So a uh, next state is basically how you implement these APIs or these commands uh, in the abstract state machine. For example, when the user borrow a book, we can just take a book from the list, the library list, and put it in the user's list. Uh, and in post condition, we can check uh, this invariant, which is at any time, only one book A can exist in both uh, in the combined list of the library list and the user's list. Right. So uh, this is just an example to give you some idea of how, uh, how to write all these callbacks. So uh, next, we will look into something interesting, uh, which, which is how I used stateful probability assessing to fix a concurrency bug in Lyre. Uh, we'll do a not live demo, um, because nobody should do live demos in, <laughs> in presentations. Uh, but also remember, the, the demo I'm going to show you is, uh, is one that is more recent than this case studies. But we are just using it to show you what the output of running stateful probability based testing looks like. And when running this test, let's see what we can learn from this. So uh, well, I'm going to talk about how to read the test output from the stateful probability based testing and how to use the output to fix a bug, basically. And then we'll talk about how effective stateful probability-based testing is compared to example-based tests. And then we'll touch on some lessons I learned by writing these stateful probability-based testing, and hopefully it will, be, it will be useful when you start to write your stateful probability-based testing. And then finally, uh, I'll give you some inspiration for how to find a system property for your system. And so, Let's look at the, uh, yeah, just on time. Um, so it's a lot of output, but first we start with the euro like indicate of success, like all these dots are good tests. But when we hit a failure, right, first is the proper output uh, because it's an Erlan engine. Um, so all these outputs are in Erlan style. Uh, it's not very useful because next, we can customize how we want to show these uh, information. So here I'm, I'm saying, uh, in this case, we originally generated 37 commands, but we only successfully run 13 of them. So we failed on the 14th command. And uh, yeah, you can customize how all these things look. You can customize the, the state and the results and stuff like that. And then there is a very, 
oh, there is a very important one called shrinking. Uh, so it tries to reduce the, uh, the size of the counterexample, right? We'll talk about this right next after this. And then again, the, the same thing happens again in the proper output and your custom output again. Uh, and after shrinking, you can actually see uh, here, we generated, after shrinking, there is only four commands in this case. Uh, and we successfully run th three of them, and the last one failed, basically. And after all these, we have the familiar EX unit output, and then the capture log. So capture log is, I think, very uh, useful, especially when you do probably based stateful probably based testing, uh, and to debug um, crash cases. Because if you don't do capture log, this will scatter around all the shrinking and all the proper output. So it's very hard for you to figure out what is wrong. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so yeah, basically that's all um, the output. So uh, as I said, we'll talk about shrinking. Shrinking is very important. It's actually as important as generating a big uh, failure case or counter example because it reduced or removes all the inconsequential commands. Or we can say it reduces all the noises when you try to debug a problem. So it lets us focus on the real problems. And <clears throat> basically in the case study, remember this is different than the one I showed you in the demo. Uh, originally we have 27 commands in the failure cases. Uh, but, and after shrinking, we only have nine. So we removed two thirds of useless things that doesn't contribute to the failure. So. Uh, if you don't do any advanced customization, you will see these output for commands. And we call these symbolic calls. Uh, this, because this is useful if we want to <coughs> manipulate uh, how you are going to do function calls and how you are going to use the results especially. Uh, but for Lyra, in this case study, we don't really care about this. So we can transform them to what is the actual calls in Lyra. Right. Uh, so we start a location and we load. We start location nine and we load an item on it. We start another location seven and load another item, and we add a mo modifier between these two items and we try to unload both of them, and then we load another item and do another thing. Uh, spoiler alert! I actually auto generated these later, so I can just copy paste the entire section of this and put it into an IX shell, and uh, I can reproduce the failure cases basically. So easier for you to debug what is wrong or what is the state at that point for the entire system. So uh, going back to all the nine commands, it actually looks the same. Like we don't do anything crazy like loading an item to a non-exist uh, location or whatnot. Uh, so here is what capture log comes into play, right? We can use it to figure out what is actually wrong with our system. So first, like this, the log output will, go, will give you the direct calls. We are trying to get an attribute from a new item. We are trying to get attribute 46 from a new item. And that's obviously bad. Uh, so that's the direct cause of this actor uh, crashed. And the first line tells us which actor crashed. It's maybe not very obvious, but this is basically a registry from Elixir. And so here we are saying location 7 crashed. And the last line is also very important or very useful because it tells us uh, this actor crashed during handling which message. So <clears throat> At this time, it's a cast command or cast call. It's a gen server dot cast, and the message is a rim target, which in Liar it basically means remove item modifier at target location. So here we have to think: in the nine commands, there is no remove modifier commands. So I realize this must ha must happen during some item unload. And now we can split the nine commands to several several stages. So first. Before we do the item unload stuff, uh, we call it a setup stage. So we basically add two, uh, add two items and have a modifier. And after this point, this is basically how uh, the entire system looks like. We have two locations and two items and a modifier between them. And this is how what causes this crash, right? So we try to unload uh, the, both items. And remember, like when we are running tests, the test is also from one Erlang process or one actor. So when we call <coughs> unload item 92, we actually send a message to location 9 uh, and tell him, tell him to unload or remove this item, basically. And because there is an outgoing modifier from 92 to 88, which is on another location, right? So location 9 will try to tell location 7, hey, please 
remove this outgoing modifier because the item is already gone, the source item is already gone. And <clears throat> then we, in the test, we also try to unload item 88. And this is where concurrency spike, uh, strikes. So if the unload item uh, 88 call uh, cost arrives first at location seven, then when we try to remove the modifier and uh, <coughs> recalculate the new value of this modifier, then, then the item is already gone. And that's exactly what happened in the trying to get an attribute from a new item because the item is already not there. And realizing this concurrency bug is actually very easy to fix, right? We just don't care about this call uh, because the item is already gone. We don't need to care about its modifier or whatnot anymore. Uh, but we only covered seven commands, but remember after shrinking, we actually have nine commands, right? So this is very interesting uh, because later I realized why this happened. Uh, I'll talk about it later. But what basically uh, this means is, or what this, is, what this highlights is Erlang and SAS Elixir provides very strong isolation between actors. So one crushed actor, like in this case, location seven crushed, but it doesn't damage any other ones. Like location nine still operates normally and it doesn't crush the entire VM. Uh, <clears throat> so it's very good. And proper shows us not only like all the steps and only the necessary steps to produce the crash, it also shows us how to observe the failure. So, uh, <clears throat> yes, yeah, a very interesting discovery uh, when I realized what these two commands are doing. Uh, and after we fix the bug, we want to validate whether uh, our fix is effective, right? Uh, and prop check is being helpful here because it saves this one uh, failure case for you. So we can see here when we run the stateful property based test, it only runs one successful case. And this is a case or the nine commands that, that is generated after shrinking. <clears throat> uh, this is helpful because especially in complex stateful property based testing, uh, reproducing a same failure case is not guaranteed. Uh, you might need a long time to find it. You might need multiple tries to even find one failure case. So prop check is very helpful. It saves this and you just test uh, this one save counter example. And using stateful property based testing, I discovered all sorts of other bugs, uh, even a bug in a dependent package. Uh, but what is more interesting is how effective stateful property based testing can be. So here is a lines of code comparison at the time I conducted the case study. So at that point, I have a little bit over 900 lines of code, like actual functionality code. And <clears throat> The example-based test I read during test-driven development is about 350, but I only need 177 lines of stateful property-based testing code. And to uncover like way more uh, interesting bugs uh, compared to example-based testing. And another thing is like about 40% of these 350 lines are just duplicated setup things that you, that you do like in every test, right? So, Compared to stateful property based testing, it's also fun to write stateful property based testing. It's also a very important factor uh, when you do stuff. Uh, and um, I worked uh, just a little bit more on this project because I was kind of busy the last few months. But now I have a little bit over 1,000 lines of actual functionality code. And I basically didn't write any more example tests. Uh, this, the, the only one I added is actually a failure case that stateful property based testing gives me. Uh, and I expanded the uh, stateful property based testing quite a bit. I introduced uh, more commands to generate uh, and even process.exit. So I can test like the remaining locations works just fine when one location dies for whatever reason. Right? Uh, <clears throat> I did a lot of refactoring uh, for readability of the test. And also, as you've seen earlier, the debug output, which I can copy paste into an AX shell and just reproduce the entire thing. That contributes about 100 lines here. Uh, so seeing so effective stateful property based testing and so fun it can be, like you might wonder like, how I can run one myself. Uh, in this case, I can rec recommend no better than propertesting.com. Uh, it's another great project by Fred Herbert. And basically, I started doing stateful property based testing after I read the related chapters there. And uh, <clears throat> this talk won't be possible without his work. So many thanks. Uh, 
he recently turned this project into a full-blown book. Um, it int uh, includes several other, uh, more advanced content, so if you want to support him, just buy the book. And he has other resources, for, like most of them are free for online reading as well, uh, Learning with Sam Erlen, for Greg Wood, uh, Erlen Younger, which is a very useful book for, you, for live debugging your system. And I think the Zen of Erlen is another highlight for me. It basically builds up the entire uh, philosophy of, how, uh, of beam based languages, basically. Uh, <clears throat> so instead of like, going through a step-by-step -step guide of how to write, uh, state for probability based testing. I'll just show you some of the lessons I learned by writing uh, the state for probability based testing for Lyra. So first, uh, there are five callbacks. And first, command is supposed to control command generation, and precondition is supposed to validate generated commands. Uh, these two callbacks are very confusing to me in the beginning because I thought, hey, they are basically doing the same thing, right? So why is there a precondition after I can use command to basically control what command I should generate at each point? Uh, and later I discovered command should be used for a high level filtering of what is a valid command. So for example, for liar, uh, when there is no locations, we can only start location, right? When there is no items, we can start more locations or load items onto it. And when we have items, uh, most of the functions are valid, like we can unload these items or add modifiers between them. And when we have modifiers, uh, we can also remove them, right? Uh, <clears throat> the important part, or what I think the command helps you is, it forces you to think how flexible the system is, right? So instead of saying we only generate a uh, load item when there is a location, we can also say, hey, the system should be flexible enough to give user useful arrows when you are trying to load an item to a non-existing uh, location. But I think it depends on uh, how flexible you, your, you want your system to be or how arrow friendly your system want to be. But also, uh, uh, in probability-based testing, you also want to test most of the valid cases, right? You want to actually see the system run some commands that make sense rather than just giving back arrows always. Uh, but the most important part of command compared to precondition is it's not used during shrinking. And that's exactly what precondition tries to do. Uh, so you should always validate all the arguments and commands uh, in precondition. Pre uh, for example, when you try to load an item to a location, you, you should always check this location exists in your abstract state machine already. Uh, correct shrinking relies on precondition. If you don't do precondition, then you will see these things, things like this. Like uh, when I don't do Precondition, I, I just see like a direct load item thing. I was like, what the hell? There is no location started. Why? Like I, I write, please don't generate these command in commands, right? <laughs> but, but that's exactly what precondition helps. Uh, and now we can uh, detail like what the shrink step is doing. So basically we use the command callback to generate like 30 or 40 commands to run. And when we found the failure cases, we basically try to remove random commands from these 30 or 40 commands, and then only use precondition to validate whether the remaining sequence is valid. And only if it's valid, then we will try to run the entire uh, remaining sequence again. Uh, <clears throat> but after realizing this, I also uh, start to realize that because those of these two uh, functions do a lot of the similar things, uh, we need to dry ourselves a little bit. So what I did is I extracted functions to list what is valid and what is not valid, and then build uh, generators out of those. And then in the function, in these callbacks, I reuse these functions a lot. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> the next two set is next state and post condition. And this is basically what makes uh, stateful probability-based testing stateful, right? And the important bit here is don't repeat your logic. Don't repeat what you're doing in your real system. Uh, you can achieve this by using a simpler state or use an inefficient algorithm compared to your real system. Uh, you can check, also, uh, besides checking results, you can also check partial environments. Uh, for example, in the library example, you, you can check there is always only one book exists in both lists. And besides all the callbacks, I have some other general nodes. Uh, fixing, the node, uh, fixing the model or the test uh, is normal, just like in your stateless property-based testing. Uh, but don't forget to run makes propcheck.clean to remove the saved counterexample. 
uh, because otherwise you will see very weird results after you change how the model works. Uh, adjust frequency to ex expose different bugs. This is very useful, especially when you are adding more commands to, uh, to the command generation. Uh, increase those frequency can expose, like can make it, you can test more interactions of the new commands. And also adjust the number and size of tests. I think this is especially helpful if your setup is very heavy. For example, if you need 10 or 20 steps to just set up the entire system, then you should tweak the minimum size of your C4 for VS setting to be that size. Uh, but nevertheless, grid tool helps. Um, PropCheck have grid integration with mixed tests, so just use it for most of the cases. Um, and I want to touch a little bit on a thing that is, or several things that are specific to Lyre. Uh, in most of the tutorials, you will see they are testing a single RLM process, uh, trying to model the internal state of this single uh, actor. But what I'm doing for Lyre is I'm testing all the locations, so there are multiple actors. And this basically means I require, it requires synchronization, right? Uh, and I have a fancy term for this called consistency guarantee, and it basically means uh, only after all the messages are handled, I can assure the system is consistent from all sides. Uh, and I basically achieve this by doing a synchronized gensor.call after certain commands, for example, the add atom modifier. Uh, 